What are we Lynn about? Ruth Miller, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Welcome back to Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp. Oh, my God. I'm so glad to be here. I didn't think I'd make it another year. Why do you say? How old are you now? I'm 86. 86? I know that's fucking old. Well, my mother's 80. All right, she'll get there. She still gets around. I still get Does she drive? She drives wonderfully. I drove not wonderfully. I was... <laughs> I was I was a mass uh, murderer until I moved over to London and then stopped driving. Stop lying. <laughs> Why did you move to London? I mean, that was a, I think it's a risk for anybody. Uh, there was a French comedian I went to have dinner at his house last night. And I was in Paris last year and he was telling me it was his dream to move to L.A. And him and his wife, they just, they got a little tiny apartment. They were so happy. And, I, I you know, I told him I was proud of him because I think it's a, not many people are brave enough to take a risk in their life. Uh, oh my God, and, I take a risk every day. And then, I get up. And then to move to an entire, another country, I, I think that. is really ballsy. Well, I did it when I was 80. I yeah. know. So the, so at 80 years old, what made you... I was offered a job. Wipe your ass on the United <laughs> States. <and laughs> I did, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I lost my house, the 2008 thing. I fought to keep my house for... How did you lose it? Was it refinancing? No, I refinanced the house when I had plenty of equity. It must have been 2000, it was 2008, so it must have been 2005. And then, because I'm not very good at math, I thought that I got 400000 out of the house, and I still had plenty of equity. And I thought, I thought I'd never spend anything, but I did. What happened is I gave it to a smart investor, and I was living off the interest of four hundred. Then in 2008, everything collapsed. And I no longer had equity, and the amount of money I had in the stock market went down to 200000 which is still a lot of money. So somebody lied to you. A lot of people lied to me. That you were covered That's right. on this um, refinancing. That's right. And so I s- tried to do something, and then Wells Fargo immediately tripled my mortgage. But you, wow, thanks, Wells Fargo. Thank you. Tripled it. And when I wrote them, I wish I still had the letter. I, I appealed to national, all the national help things, and they nobody would help. And then Wells Fargo, in defense of what they were doing, because it was the, 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 the um, mortgage was something like 3000 a month, and my income was 800 okay? And, and they're not supposed to make a payment, a house payment, less than a third of your income. And I will never forget this letter. I wrote them and I said, well, this is about five times my income, you know, huh? And they wrote back this thing with playing with the numbers where they said, well, if you deduct the taxes and you deduct the depreciation and you add the effect that you're an old bitch and whatever, it turns out that this is just a third of your income. And I'm looking, $3,000 a month and my income is 800 and I've got proof of that. And the, and the big organization bought it. They said, well, you don't qualify. And they would not help. So who fucked you? Wells Fargo? Wells Fargo did. Uh, the country. It's very difficult, Lovey. You can't imagine it because you're a white middle class male. What it's like to be, at that time, an 80-year-old Jewish female alone. No family. No one to help. And nobody came to help me. And so, in the meantime, I was... They literally come and kick you out of your house? They tried twice. They tried three times. But I kept declaring bankruptcy (laughs) and then not filing the papers because I had a friend named Chris Rankin who was supposed to be helping me. Turned out he wasn't much of a help either. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, oh, he was not. Well, you hear what he did. But he had just gotten a job with Wells Fargo, with Wells Fargo as an investment counselor. And then my original investment counselor decided she didn't want to handle my account anymore because she was afraid with the, the, the when it, it collapsed that I would blame her. And I didn't really blame her. It just it, You couldn't help it. The stock market was nuts at but that time. But you're Jewish. I certainly am. One of my favorite comedians in the world is Dave Attell. He's Jewish also? Yes, and he is does... He, he does is he, he single? Uh, he is. I could probably... Well, yeah, well, let's get in touch. Uh, sure, all right. <laughs> uh, maybe you guys should look for each other on Tinder. Or oh, yeah, why not? Well, I don't know what kind of... What body What's part your, how's, you your, how's your Tinder profile? No, it's not too good. Are you it's smashing it on there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a lot of left swipes. I'm getting a lot of left swipes. So... <laughs> He's Jewish, and he has a great line. Uh, he's one of my favorite comedians. And he said, he, oh, it was a, I forget how it goes, but he says, um, you know, like, American people or non-Jewish people really 
love Halloween and they like getting scared at these haunted houses. <laughs> he said, uh, I'm Jewish and there's only one word that frightens Jewish people and that's refinancing. <laughs> He's so right. He's if, right. If his cautionary joke, yeah, I mean, like I, I've, I've never owned me. a house, but I would never refinance no, don't. just because I heard him tell that joke. It, it destroyed me. It absolutely destroyed me. But I fought Wells Fargo for three years, which is no tears for me. That meant I paid no house payment and no insurance. So I was saving money on my 800 and something a month. Plus, I mean, remember, that was my income, but I also had insurance. I had Medicare and I had Ohio State, Ohio, the state of Ohio insurance. So my, my income was actually higher than that, but it was about 800 that was the cash I got. Anyway, and while I was, I was making a big in Edinburgh, and I don't know whether you remember, but in 2014, I won Best Cabaret of the Edinburgh That's Festival. That's the year I was there. No, you were there the next year. Then no, I, I was there in 2014. Then it was 2013 that I won. Okay. So it was the year before. And, um, and the guy that helped produce that show decided I was ready for the O2. Which, I mean, I'm not. I'm just a small... For the O2 Arena? Yes. Okay. Well, that's ridiculous. So he offered me a job in Brighton. And I thought, you know, I've been fighting Wells Fargo for three years. I'm not going to win. I'm not going to win. So I did a short sale. And they sold the house. They sold the house for so much money that both... It took two insurance, two real estate agents. Each one of them made more when they divided what they got, their commission, they made more. Each one of them made more than I made in a year. And they did that. And um, I, they sold the house almost immediately. But I refused to sign the papers until September. And then at that time, uh, and I came back. I already had a job in Brighton as a, as a presenter in um, a presenter for a new TV station. It was called, the program was Brighton Lights. And the name of the TV station, believe it or not, was the latest TV. I remember they were filming you in That's right. Edinburgh. They were filming me all over the place because everybody thought I was going to be the ne next thing, next best thing to slice bread. But I was not. And when I got there, the, the man, whose name was Bill Smith, figured out that he could go to the university in Brighton and get somebody to do what I was doing for nothing. So he fi hired me in April. I put my show on at Soho Theater, which you want to go to for three weeks. And it was a hit. But it wasn't really a hit. They padded the house. I mean, it was a, everybody that saw it were hysterical. They thought it was really great. I'm not that sure it was that great. But anyway, um, and and then, um, uh, but but it wasn't. I, I wasn't that great. And when I was doing the the presenting for him, he was paying me a thousand pounds a month, and he decided he could save money if he got someone from 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 the university. So in December, he fired me. And he said I was terrible, and I didn't know what I was doing. And then he rebroadcast for two years. He kept rebroadcasting those terrible shows. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was left without a visa, without money, except for my pension, without money, and um, and and without any. I had no job. So if you lost your visa, how did you make it work where you could stay in England? What I did is for six months. I was I was I was a United States tourist. Because you can stay there for six months. And then when I went back, so I lost in April. So you have to count the months. When I went back to Edinburgh, I was asking everyone for help. I couldn't find a sponsor because nobody wanted to sponsor an 81-year-old woman. They didn't think that there was any future in it. And nobody wanted to sponsor me. And then when I went back to Edinburgh, and I think this is where you saw me, I told Hartley Kemp at Sea Venues, they were going to throw me out, and what was I going to do? Because I did not have enough money to move back to California. Because by that time, I had no insurance. I had no place to live. And I'm still living on 800-something a month. I had no... And I said to Hartley, they're going, to, they're going to kick me out. And he wrote a man named John Keyes, who had refused me for the last year. I'd been writing him. But when Hartley wrote him... He wrote and said, yes, he would sponsor me. And I have been on a tourist visa of a Tier 5, which is... Good. John Keyes is a great guy. I used he to is work a great guy. And he was a great guy. <clears throat> Sweetheart. And he is. And he, but he wouldn't sponsor me until Hartley. <clears throat> and he's been sponsoring me, but now he has not been such a great guy. He really has not. What happened is we, he sponsored me from that time on. I paid him every three months. Did you do the three month or did you do the year? No, I would just work for him sporadically. Ah, so you didn't need a visa? No. 
Because you have a Dutch visa, do you not? Or a Dutch? I used to, and then I would only go over there, uh, you know, a week at a time, and then go back to Holland. Well, I'm living over there, and and I'm not supposed to be living over there. I'm I'm so my actual address is in um is in Burlingame. It's twenty seven oh nine Mariposa. That's right. But I have been living in the UK and going back and forth, and in. July, I was supposed to, this is already, this has been going on now for five, six years. And uh, in July, I had was going to Stockholm, and I said to call John, and I said, well, we have to renew it again. And he said, I've been disqualified. And that is because he's a nice guy, and he was, he was sponsoring all of us, and we weren't all exactly legal. So he was disqualified. That was last July. Oh, so he lost everybody he had? He lost everybody he had. <clears throat> there are two people there that will sponsor you for like double the money and 50 times the paperwork and I am so bad at paperwork I'm terrible uh so I kept dealing with John and John who is a sweetheart said you can be a tourist because I said yeah but I'm earning money he said yeah you can be a tourist because the people the tax people where you earn money don't talk to the people at the home office and I kept thinking no you're wrong but so far he's been right and then this time I discovered that I was not qualified for medical care. I am 86 years old. I have just gotten rid of bladder cancer. I had cancer on my back. I've got osteoporosis. I'm in good shape, knock on wood, but it's a good thing to be able to have a doctor when you know that you're going to break a bone at any moment and you're liable to get that. I'm supposed to get this cancer back. So I said to him, well, I need, I need medical care. And then he found somebody who would sponsor me for six months, but he sort of dropped the ball. John just got married. Did you know that? And he had a honeymoon in Las Vegas? No. Yeah. So he's been busy making a life. And he dropped the ball. I was supposed to... He knew about this in November. And he just started working on it January 10th. So we didn't get the papers together in time. And then I just... And then I... In order to get this six-month thing, you have to mail your passport in. I can't do that. I'm going back January 30th. And I've got gigs. I've got all kinds of stuff I can't do. And so I said, I can't do it. And then he said, okay, you have to do the three-month thing. But then he just wrote me this big, long, involved letter where the three-month thing isn't going to work this time because somewhere on my Facebook it says I have moved to London and that the home office is inspecting it and nobody wants to take the risk. So I'm right back to being a tourist. I'm going back again as a tourist. I'm scared to death. And that's the story. Okay, so let's talk about the happier the experiences happier thing, that yes. you've had in England. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, what keeps you there? Oh, the people. If the, it's such a pain in the dick to get all this paperwork I don't have a and dick, visas. Honey. <laughs> no, I, well, I've got a permanent place to live, so I've got that security. I'm in an old age, a Jewish old age home. I've got a lot of people working. I'm trying to keep me there. I got to convert before I hit yeah, 60. Yeah, you've got to do that. <laughs> do it. You're all equipped, you're physically <laughs> ready for it. You could do it. Um, that I've got, I have a permanent uh, Sunday night gig that now, I just got it, uh, where I do a night in Soho and I sing two songs and, and uh, make them laugh. And I'm sort of a regular in all these places. I have made a career, something I couldn't do in San Francisco town. In San Francisco, I would be booked, but I would be booked occasionally. I'm part of the comedy scene there. I tour the country sometimes, and I've also, I'm on the international circuit. I think you know that. I don't know whether you actually saw what I've been doing. Yeah, I've seen your postings. You've been going to Amsterdam a lot? Berlin. Um, Barcelona is in the, it's coming. Dublin, Dublin twice a year. Um, so are you, are, you, are you writing a lot of material <laughs> from these new experiences? I write it, and John Fleming puts it on his blog. Cambodia. I've been in Cambodia twice. Singapore, four times. Bangkok. What times. insights have you gained from going to these places? I'm thinking. I've, I've gained the eye that funny is funny. Something that you learned also. Funny is funny. I listen to the comedians that they have there. And I have discovered that the American scene and the British scene are much more sophisticated 
than anywhere else. I don't know whether you notice it. I haven't been to Tumblr. I haven't been to Tumblr, so I haven't heard. But I know. But I've been to Bob's um, Bob's show. Bob McLaren. God, he's a Cafe, nice man, Amsterdam, isn't he? Wonderful man. Most wonderful and funny. He's been on this podcast. Oh God, he's absolutely superb. And I've been to his show. And the Amsterdam comedians, while in England and in America, they would be just the middle, and they're the top there that I've seen. Uh, in Berlin... Where? In, in Amsterdam? In Amsterdam. In Berlin, I have been to Christian, whatever his name is. Schutte. He's a doll. But when I saw the comedians that he booked, they're not the caliber that we see in, in, in America and in Britain. I'm in Britain. I'm top of the middle. I'm top of the... You're there, top there. of the middle. At, at 86. The, the, there's there's the, the beginners who are terrible, and there's the middle, and I'm top of the middle. And then I'm... Um, but I'm not in the top business there. But when I go overseas, when I go overseas, I'm a hit. I get standing ovations. Uh, you know where I heard the best comedy, believe it, is Kuala Lumpur. I love Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, do you know Rizal? Yeah. They, Isn't uh, he adorable? The he just, crack house. Yes. Yeah, I've done it's it several a, it, times. Don't you love it? One of the greatest food trucks on the planet Earth is parked out front. It's oh, called, why it's didn't called I the know fat that. one. Why didn't I know that? It's not kosher. <laughs> I don't eat kosher food. But I'm staying with them the next time. He's just shacked up with a lady. This is in a Muslim country where they don't do that kind of thing and had a baby. That's the fun Muslim country. Oh, God, it's wonderful. Because it's tropical and the women wear these beautiful colored Oh, they wear scarves. the most beautiful you know, yeah. the headscarves. And and I found them very progressive, didn't you? I do, and I really love the... I've talked about it many times on this podcast. That the slogan for Malaysia is one Malaysia. You got three different ethnicities. You got... Malay Muslims, Indian Hindu, and Chinese. And Chinese, Christian and I think Buddhist. I think the Chinese are the are the ones that have all the money. Yeah. I forget because they make jokes about. They say the Chinese. the Chinese are the Jews of Asia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and I'm writing a guy named Sim. We're still in touch. And 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 a wonderful guy named named Nate that that's doing a trombone trombone accompaniment to my strip. So I'll strip there. I, the best comedy. Their local comedians are great. Did you find that? They start out, the, the local comedians are great. And I loved it. The best, best comedy, I think, in Asia. And then Hanoi. You must know Hanoi. You must I've, know. I've, Dan I have, uh, my uh, new album is called Around the World. Yeah. I recorded it in 24 cities around the world. It starts in Paris, ends in Jerusalem, and there's a Hanoi track from... From Dan Dockery. You're talking to me about the... I've been doing these international circuit gigs for 20 years. I only And you're started, asking me about these gigs and you just started a couple years yeah, ago. Yeah, but I just... Love, why, is that amazing? I think it's funny. Like, you're <laughs> yes. asking me, do you know this? Do you, do know, you know this guy? He's things. absolutely wonderful. I Not only do I know it, I've recorded an album with these tracks. Well, I have a picture of Dan Dockery and I on a motorcycle. You have to see us. I went on a tour with him... Um, Last year, um, no, it was 2018, and I had a wreck 45 miles oh, north God, of Hanoi. Really? But I was wearing a helmet, and I didn't get hurt. He always puts a helmet on me, too. But in Saigon, I go with Quinn, and she doesn't bother with a helmet, and she's drunk as a lord as we go wandering around. Yeah, this next time I'll be celebrating my birthday for a week in Saigon with her. When is your birthday? October 11th. I'll be 87. Okay, nice. I nice. hope. So what are the what are the fun funny and fun experiences you've had traveling? Absolutely with? marvelous. Well, wherever I go in Southeast Asia, they take one look at me and they think, "Oh God, she's going to die," and I get priority everything. <laughs> right? Yeah, I never have to wait in line at an airport. They're no, we'll take you, we'll carry you in. Um, fun experiences are just that I have made friends. When I go to Singapore now, I stay with a family. And I, I always said, and, and when I go there in Singapore, you've been to Singapore, I'm sure. Yeah. And I, do, I used to usually stay with Umar and his wife, but now I stay with a Jewish family. I just, Dublin, I do Dublin every six months and I'm established there. I actually, I mean. What do you play you, in Dublin? I play the Laughter Lounge. I pay the International. I pay on Shaw and then a bunch of women's things. Cherry comedy. You wouldn't qualify for that one. And, and um, the Woolshed, which used to be that gay guy's that gay guy's uh, comedy, and then he was arrested for being inappropriate all over the place. Oh, uh, God, I love that guy. Alan, yeah, he's lovely. Uh, what was his name? It's not Alan. Oh, 
Al. 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 That's it. I love that guy. Al something. Yeah, I love it. No, yeah, he's what a sweet. I heard that the last time I was there that he had um, had like a oh terrible. They, they they nobody wants him anymore, and he's funny. He's one of them, but he got very very drunk and very high, and I guess he said things he shouldn't be saying. So the wool shed is no longer run by him, hmm. but by somebody else who I always he was forget. like an Oscar Wilde. That's right, really a huge, flamboyant, beautifully dressed, very funny. Al, God, what was his last name? Don't remember, but anyhow, uh, so I do, but I, I do that one as well. So, and what are your best stories from from these experiences? I'm trying to, my best stories are just that I do it, that people remember me, that people. Uh, I just got an email from somebody who said, "Do you remember me? I was uh, you were on the bus from Kins uh, from from Dublin to Kinsale." No, I don't remember her. <laughs> remember me? Uh, that I'm 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 making friends. I guess I'm trying to think. What are funny stories? They're they're, they're funny stories. Is that I'm funny. <laughs> I, that I do well there. I do amazingly well. well I, I remember the last time you were on this podcast, <clears throat> you said something very brilliant. You said a few brilliant things. I but so. we were talking about World War II and Germany, and you said, I don't think enough sympathy has been shown to the German people I agree. for what they went through. I agree. And you blew my mind with that statement. And I thought, wow, because I've always... I'll give you. I'll give I've you another one. Never even considered of looking at it that way, and now with um, the rise of Trump in the last three years, then I now I have a a whole new sympathy for the German people. Oh, absolutely terrible! Obviously, not everybody was with that uh, horrendous program. No, but with the Nazis, they weren't. But the, my friend Ursula's father was a school teacher, and he was going to protect his family, so he became a Nazi. And he was a very liberal, from what she says, very liberal. Just to protect But I heard the most wonderful joke when I was in Berlin the last time. I also do Berlin. I was in Berlin. This kid got up and he said, yeah, I'm German. And we all, we all hate the Nazis, but we love Grandpa. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Because it's true. But I'll give you another one with the Me Too movement, where I think every woman is going to stab me. I think that we're denigrating men and we're confusing men and we're not... Uh, we're not. We we need to to be more respectful of men. I think that that we're we're making them second class citizens, and I think it's wrong. I do a lot of good jokes about it, though. Really good jokes. Well, what do you say? I say that if I were a man, I would be hired twice as much. I would be paid twice as much. If I were a man, I wouldn't have vaginal itch. If I were a man, I wouldn't have to wear a bra, and I wouldn't have to wear makeup, but if I were a man, I'd have to lift things and fix things, and i have to be a cunt. It's one of my best... <laughs> but I think... I mean, I have capitalized on it. I make fun of men all the time, but I don't think... I think that we need to stop. I think it's terrible. I think young men don't know how to act. They don't know... You know, you're going out on a date, so you think, should I open the door for her, or is she going to deck me when I open the door? What should I do? Should I send her flowers? What should I do? Should I should I pay for this, or should I not? What What should I do? Because... The world is in transition. The world is in transition. Male-female relationships are changing. Family, the idea of family is changing. The idea of success is changing. The idea of what your future, what a good future is, is, is changing. The idea of interpersonal relations are changing. We're talking to each other face-to-face. -face. That's absolutely beautiful. But most of the world talk to each other on, on a screen. That's not the same thing. I don't know whether it's better or worse. I don't want to make a judgment. But I know that the world is changing. And I think that we can't say, oh, we want the good old days. I mean, I do jokes about that, too. Who wants the good old days? In the good old days, if you, if you were feeling emotionally upset, you, couldn't go, you didn't go to a psychiatrist. If, you, you, if you, you were acting funny, we locked you in the attic. That's what we did. You didn't get to do things like that. Uh, we've come a long way. And I was talking to my friend Lily in Germany about how 2019 was just such a horrendous year. Every bad thing you can think of happened in 2019. And, and I said, you know, the prognosis is not good for 2020. And she said to me, yes, it is. Because women are fighting to make you see that, that they have, that they're people, uh, that little Greta, whatever her name is, who's, who's who, every, I always look at her picture. Thunberg. She's always angry, angry little girl. She's making us see that we're destroying our environment. We, we have no sense of respect for the earth that feeds us. Um, men are, are becoming much more um, open to, to different, different ideas and to different, that worth what their status is. You don't see, or at least we don't in the circles that I'm in, you don't see these macho, I'm a man kind of thing anymore. I don't know whether you do, but I don't. I see very liberal people 
that I mean, I always say I don't want to be a feminist. I want to be a humanist. Uh, I see very liberal, open-minded people where men are not afraid to show their emotions. They're not afraid to show that they care. They don't have to always be top dog. They don't. I mean, it must have been hell to be a man in the 50s. Stop and think. You had to earn a living for a demanding wife who expected everything of you because she did nothing. You had to earn a living. You had to protect her. You had to uh, take care of those children. You had to pay for everything. Nowadays, you can get grants and you can get scholarships that weren't available then. must have been awful. must have been awful to always have to be strong. That's a horrible thing, I think, because I'm not strong that often. Yeah. yeah. Why, um, yeah that, in, in the 86 years you've been on this planet, what are the... You know, what are the, has anything changed as drastically changed. as it has now? Like, isn't this the the biggest epoch? Uh, you mean right now? Yeah. No, it's all been gradual. It's all been gradual. Little by little, inch by inch, and then all of a sudden you look and say, oh, it really is different. But it's been happening, little by little by little. I don't remember when I was in college. I bought in, when I was in college, that's 51 to 55, that time, I bought into all the old values because Jewish first, what is it? Is it first generation, the ones that were born here? First generation? Yeah. First generation immigrants are always anxious to be, at least in America, more American than Americans. Just like when you convert to a religion, people that convert to Judaism are more Jewish than Jews. It's like that. My mother and father wanted to be more American than, than that, that was really important. That's to them. how my mother, who came from Argentina, yeah, is. same thing. They want to buy. They buy into everything, and so my mother wanted me to get married, wanted me to have children. But I'll tell you something. I believed all that. I believed I had to be a virgin when I got married, which is why I was such a failure when we went on the dates. I believed all that because it had been inundated into me. But the people that had been here, like the second generation people, they didn't buy into that at all. They, women, they wanted careers. I remember at the University of Michigan, I wanted a career. And when I came back home, my father said to me, why did you bother? You're going to get married anyway. Didn't I surprise them? But yeah, the, 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 they didn't. The, the, it's happening little by little by little. It's happening. We have a freer world. We have a world where there's opportunity. We have a world where we can be any gender we want to be now, a little bit at a time. We make fun, but it's still it's happening I mean, I know a lot of transgender people when I was younger. I never knew it existed. I think it's wonderful. I think it's, I mean, we can, we can make jokes. We can say, well, uh, like the lesbians who all think that the transgender women aren't really women. That's one minority attacking another minority. We have the right to be what we want to be now. When I was younger, we didn't have that right. You had to fight for it. You had to go underground. Now you can say what you want to be, and nobody's. I, I think it's a. I think we're on the way to something wonderful. I think, if we don't get blown up because of that dumb guy pushing the button. But other than that, well, the thing that gives me hope is you know after George Bush we got Obama. I loved Obama. So after Trump, our next president's going to be a black left-handed midget lesbian. I think. Oh well, God. I'll vote for it. I will too. I'll vote Her. for they. Her. They. They. Her. They. They. I'll vote for they. <laughs> for them. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm into it. I think that the country it used to be it used to be that there was this big block of the country that just was just redneck, blue collar, one way thing. You come from that, don't you? You're a Florida well, class. Somewhat. Yeah, I mean so it's, it's yeah. I mean it's But and when you go it's home 50, and 50. Fl- when you go to Florida, don't you find that it isn't that way at all? People are very progressive because we have television. I think Florida is an amazing place. Yes, we have. I agree. We have we have television now, and they see they see a wider world. They see a different way of living, and it doesn't resonate with everyone. But nothing resonates with everyone. That's the beauty of the world. We're different. And we're allowing differences now. We didn't when I was younger. So nothing about this current state of the world terrifies you? No, nothing does as long as somebody is not, um, what's the word I want, uh, doesn't, doesn't take action that doesn't make sense. But I think, I'm always afraid that somebody's going to say, yeah, let's drop the nuclear bomb on them. That's crazy. But hopefully everybody has this sense of self-preservation. And I think that gradually, I think 
the world is in transition and I think it's going to a good place. It's going to a place where everyone has a right to be themselves. And isn't that the one thing we want to be? What? The only thing you have is your life. That's all. It's not everyone else's life. And your life. And you need to have the opportunity to make it what feels good to you. And you also need to have the flexibility to wake up one morning and say, ooh, I don't like this. I think I'll do something else. That's what happened when I was 80. I thought, ooh, I don't like this. I'm being attacked by, by Wells Fargo. Ooh, I'll do something else. I had that right. 40 years ago, I didn't. 40, 50 years ago, an 80-year-old woman wouldn't have just picked up and gone to England. She couldn't have done it. She would have had to row over. <laughs> so what do you think about what's happening in England? I mean, aren't they kind of going backwards also? That's what it feels like. But I, yes, that's what it feels like. But I don't believe that it's going to happen. I believe that Boris Johnson, by the way, I'm the only one in the world that likes him. I know people that have gone to school with him. With that hair? Him. Oh, I think it's adorable. <laughs> Well, look at my hair. I think it's absolutely I'm precious. Teasing. Yeah, the guy and he with just a big got himself bald spot making yeah. fun of somebody's yeah. hair. Yeah, but no, That's he's got joke. he's got he just got a, a Jack Russell. You have to love a guy that got a little Jack Russell. And before he voted, he kissed the dog. Maybe that's all Trump needs to do. Yeah, to get him, get himself a Jack Russell. If he just started walking around with a Jack Russell tail. That would do it. Let's write him and tell him. He'd be thrilled. He could stop tweeting. Just show a picture of that Jack Russell. The whole world would come running. Yeah, we love you. We love you, Donnie. Okay, this Donnie guy couldn't have done anything wrong. Yeah, not not if he good loves some dogs. Not if he loves a Jack Russell. Anyway, uh, I think that Boris. Johnson wants to go down in history as the man that saved Britain from complete collapse because for three years they've been paralyzed because of this Brexit thing. And I think he's, did you see where he had a cabinet meeting or whatever they call their little group, their in-group, and he said, anybody that, that gives me trouble, you're out. <laughs> he's not fussing around. He's going to get, he's not going to have the trouble that we have with no majority in one place, one majority in one place, and one majority in another. He's given himself a majority, and he's going to act. And people say, well, he's, he's, it's destruction, it's the Tories, but he did a lot for London. He did a lot for London. He did a lot that was nice. He brought the Olympics there, didn't he? He did. He gave me a freedom pass. I don't. Seniors don't have to pay for any transportation. And if you remember, it isn't cheap to travel on the underground and on buses in London. Mm -hmm. I don't pay a thing. And, well, and, and, and he did it. And I think he's going to do good you're things. You're one of those foreigners sucking off the system. Yes, and I'm trying not to. You're the to. reason people voted for Brexit. That's right. And I am trying <laughs> not to do it. I'm trying desperately not to do it. I thought this time I'd have the three-month visa, and, I'll, and I don't yet. But What's I, the funniest thing that ever happened to you on the tube? Oh, so many things are wonderful. I'll tell you one. I was on my way to Paddington, and I totally miscalculate. I totally miscalculate time. And this woman said to me, "Where are you going?" I said, "Well, I have to catch a train." And she said, just out of the blue, she said, "I'm going to help you get that train." And I think it was something like <clears throat> on the tube, and I got to Paddington at three ten. I can. I don't walk fast anymore. I don't think I ever walk fast, but I don't walk fast. Anymore. That woman grabbed my bag and ran through the, the gate, and she yelled to me, I've got an 80-year-old woman. She ran through the gate and held up that train so I could get on the train. I think I was going to Leicester or something. Paddington, it wouldn't have been Leicester. It would have been Swindon or something like that. I got on the train. And then she sent me a, 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 an email, and I sent her an email back, and we've never been in touch before. She just did it. I've, the goodness of people who are British, and let me make that very clear too. When I get on the tube, uh, there's, there's seats reserved for um, for old people, and men your age, men your age, will be sitting there with their earphones in, looking right at me, sitting in the thing, and not get up, and not get up. <laughs> but in Britain. Someone will say to him, just a minute, you've got to get up. Some, someone will say to me, I'll get that guy to stand up. And I'll say, no, no, it's all right, I can stand. But they'll, they'll do that. They, 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 they will take care of me. When I carry a big suitcase, I never have to worry. I'll get to the bottom of the stairs, top of the stairs, and people who are British will help me up the stairs. And I don't want to be racist, but people from other countries that are uh, obviously from other countries will go right past me, especially Chinese people. They will not, because they figure, listen, she got that far, let her worry about it. But in America, 
in America, I was I was in San Francisco and I took the bus up to the, to Twin Peaks. There was another guy sitting there with two of us standing in front of him. The one woman was in her 70s, so she was a child to me, and me, 86, and we're standing there, and he, he looked right at us and ignored us. And I thought, in America, I better not say you can get up. In Britain... Well, San Francisco's totally changed. Yes. Oh, it has, hasn't it? Yeah. I it's was taking a... Scary. Uh, a few years ago, I was in San Francisco, and I took an Uber pool across the city. Yeah. So you're sharing oh. the car with other people, and it makes the no, ride I know cheaper. That. Yes. There was a kid in the back seat. He's like 22 years old. He's talking on the phone. He's telling a friend of his about this restaurant that he wants his friend to visit. And the kid goes, he's 22 years old. It was the greatest lamb shank I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I didn't have my first lamb shank until I was in my 40s. <laughs> and this kid's 22 and he can make a comparison. With the lamb shanks? It just goes to show you how much money... Oh these, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. These young tech kids are making. Well, I'm not. Why is lamb shank expensive? When I was young, it was the <laughs> cheapest. It was the cheapest cut you could get. Seriously? No, seriously. Yes. Okay. Oh, and that's the other thing. You know, I haven't eaten uh, vegans. I laugh at vegans are um, a, a, a philosophical statement. They're a philosophical statement even more than a nutritious statement. And 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 <laughs> when I when I was young. Uh, we ate all these horrible things. I'll never forget. I went to a I went to a restaurant in Pacifica. Oh, right before I left, so it must have been in two thousand ten or eleven. And the the restaurant was just so good. And and the cook was my age. And I went up to him. I said, "Isn't it amazing how cooking has changed? Because at that time you didn't use butter. You had to be careful of eggs. You had to too much." And he said, uh, I, "I said nobody uses butter anymore." He says, "Well, I do. You know, because these cooking these these food fads change. These food fads change." But um, when, I, when I was young, the reason I stopped eating red meat had nothing to do with being a vegetarian. It was that I couldn't afford it. The cheapest thing I could get is fish, which is the most expensive now. And one of the things that I think is so awful about America and about Britain, and I don't know, I haven't lived anywhere else to know, is that you have to have money to eat healthy food. And that's heartbreaking to me. Well, but vegetables are the cheapest thing you can buy at the grocery store. Yeah, but you get organic vegetables. They're very expensive. But forget organic vegetables. Regular vegetables are the cheapest thing you can buy in the store. But, so actually, to eat healthy is the cheapest option. It's more expensive to get... I mean, unless you're talking uh, it elitist is, cuts of meat and fish. No. Organic vegetables are much healthier because they don't have the the. the they're not sprays. grown with shit water. That's right. And they're not injected with stuff to get bright colors. And, and I, I did a whole thing about the, the, the voyage of a carrot from the farmer's field to Safeway's, Safeway's uh, counter. And they're just, they're, they're, they're empty food, that food. But that's the food we can afford. And they've all been, the, 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 the processed food is the food that you can afford. And that tastes good to these children. I mean, you give children... They have to, it has to have a taste. They could they could afford organic food. I think nobody knows what a tomato <clears throat> tastes like anymore. Not in the you're United You're telling States. me, not in the United States. No, in Britain. Yeah, you're right. The so tomatoes, you go to Italy and it's the food it's, is. I just, know it's just so good. Oh God. What's your favorite vegetable? My favorite vegetable is, is cauliflower. Good one. <laughs> yeah, it gives you lots of gas, but that's worth it. I love cauliflower. Yeah, it's my favorite vegetable. But I'm learning to like potatoes. I guess you have to if you live in Britain. Yeah, I love it. But that's my favorite vegetable. But I like vegetables. I eat a lot of vegetables. I think that part of the reason, and you know, I don't have gray hair. You are you don't have much either. I got a little bit. Yeah. Well, I'm, my mom, like you, she has still no has hair. dark hair. How, and she's 80. 80, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had people ask me, do I dye my hair? No, you don't. Why would I? Why would you do yeah, that? Yeah, and I would, would leave. Uh, why, why would you do that? Sit in a beauty shop for seven hours and have that smell and the ugh, you know, and I'm chemicals. Just lucky because my mom's still got dark. And she's hair. So, she has dark hair. <clears throat> yeah, um, that's amazing. What is the silliest thing about British people? Oh, the silliest thing is no matter where you are. What the first thing they say to you is, "Are you well?" Are you well? And when I was, you know, in America, we say, how are you? Yeah. They say, are you well? And when they said, are you well? I thought they really wanted to know. So I started telling them, well, no, I've got a pain here and I've got a pain there. And I read, no, are you well? Every email you get from somebody in Britain will say, I hope you're well. And you write back and say, I am. But they don't care about that. You don't even have to answer that. You don't, are you well? 
That's the silliest thing. There's lots of silly things about England. They think they're being they're eating healthy when they have fish and chips, which is the most unhealthy. What they take to do with a piece of fish is absolutely disgusting. Their coins are very heavy and odd shaped. They are. They they're are designed to get out of your pocket. Yeah, and that, I don't. They're just. What else is funny about Britain? There's the the fact that they never use umbrellas. It pours rain all the time, but they never carry umbrellas. British people never carry umbrellas because they keep thinking, "Nah, it'll dry up pretty soon." And they come, they're dripping wet, and they, yeah, it'll dry. Yeah, that's what they do. But um, my the welfare system, the fact that they, the fact that they are so upset with the Eastern Europeans who come in there, and statistics. Over and over, they take statistics that say that the Eastern Europeans are not taking advantage of them. They're doing the work that nobody in Britain will do, and they're putting money into the system. They're paying their taxes, and they're going to the health service. And everybody gets really angry and says, "Oh, they're they're <clears throat> ruining they're ruining uh, our system, and they're the one that that's that's destroying the NHS." Not true. Not true at all. And this is the myth. This is the myth. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite books is. Uh, my God, you've got enough the, of them. Um, I should. People should know she's got wall to wall books on one side and wall to wall records and cassettes on the other. The Ragged Trousered Philanthropists. What is that? By I Robert know. Tressel. And this book is so good, and it's about England. It's about these house painters and construction workers. It's like. The nineteen the nineteen tens in England, yeah, and it's all they blame foreigners. Oh yeah, and they had... anyone who mentions socialism gets his ass beat. And it's so and, socialist. It's a they, socialist um, country. They just fight and defend the system that they got to rent their clothes and furniture, <laughs> and they people have absolutely nothing. But if you Here, if... let me read this to you: hmm. if a man is only able to provide himself and his family with the bare necessities of existence. The man's family is living in poverty. Since he cannot enjoy the advantages of civilization, he might just as well be a savage. Better, in fact, for a savage does not know what he is deprived of, what we call civilization, the accumulation of knowledge which has come down to us from the forefathers, is the fruit of thousands of years of human thought and toil. It is not the result of labor of the ancestors of any separate class of people who exist today. And therefore it is by right the common heritage of all. Every little child that is born into the world, no matter whether he is clever or dull, whether he is physically perfect or lame or blind, no matter how much he may excel or fall short of his fellows in other respects, in one thing at least, he is their equal." He is one of the heirs of all the ages that have gone before. That's absolutely right, and that's what's happening in San Francisco. You have a good job, you've got a good education, you can't afford a place to live. And, and that, but that's socialism. And Britain gets just as excited as America when they hear socialism. But they're a socialist country. That's totally, what they and the, the NSA, the, the healthcare NHS system is... Is socialist. Totally socialist, and it's the best healthcare system that's in right. the world. But you wait three years. I waited three. You wait three forever if it's not an emergency. I waited three years to get the hearing aid, and it still doesn't work. But when I had cancer, they were there like that. They got rid of it. Yep, like that. Okay. It's 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 wonderful. The care you get when you finally get it is great. And most of the people that are the aides and the people that keep the hospital going are from Eastern Europe where they're getting really angry. If they got rid of all the people from Eastern Europe in the NHS, the, the hospitals would be empty. They would, and, 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 and yet, the word socialism is, is, that's why the Tories won, because they don't want socialism, which is what they're living. It's what they've got. When in my neighborhood, the, the, the average size family is nine. The Jewish men, the Hasidic Jewish men do not work. So they, they read, they study. So that means that the welfare department, which they don't call it, they call it benefits, supports them. They get a housing, they get a housing uh, allowance, they, and they have an allowance for every kid, and for and for food. They get a car, and the British the British public are paying for all this. And I've never heard a complaint. I've never heard a complaint. This is part. They Britain. It's ingrained in Britain. I think it was is Bevan that said 
that nobody in this country, it was after World War II, nobody, or World War, yeah, World War II, nobody in this country is going to go hungry, is going to be sick, or is going to not have shelter. And the British people, that's ingrained in them. So that's become a human right. It has not become a human right here in America. And that's why of what you saw in San Francisco. You must have seen the tent cities. The tent I have city. them here. There's homeless people. There's tents people in this neighborhood. So it's the same here then as the San Francisco? Got, uh, the, the mayor declared a state of emergency last year. Really? So if you go they... downtown, it looks like, um, you know, uh, the Great Depression. So what are they doing to stop it? Nothing. Nothing. Well, in San Francisco, I know that they give them... Well, the first place, do they get food? That always worries me. And they say, yes, there's always a place to get food. I think they just voted in people... San Francisco where camping is illegal on sidewalks, which is makes it so they can remove the homeless people. So what are they going to do with them? And aren't they, don't they realize that they're creating this homeless situation with wages too low... So, the housing prices are so high that, that you can have a good job and you can't afford a place to live. You can't afford... I've never seen anything like the cost of food. London's food has gone up, but it's nothing compared to here. Absolutely nothing. Well, I mean, even here in L.A., I think I got a salad and a, and a, and a, and a croissant for $16 in Starbucks. That would be, what, maybe 14 pounds, 10 pounds. I don't know. I, I think maybe it might be about the same when I reduce it, but uh, the cost of the cost of the basic comforts, the basic things that every human being should have, are what shelter, food, and medical care. And in, here in America, that's it's outrageous. You can't you can't afford it, right? Yeah. So uh, I read this wonderful. You would know the guy, and Don, I don't know his last name. He's a Dutch author, and he wrote about utopia. And he says in the book, he says... Harry Mullish? No, I would recognize if I heard it. He wrote, he said, it's Dutch. And, and my friend from the Netherlands has read a lot of his books. He's written a lot of books. And he says, what poor people need is money. And everybody says, no. You, I mean, when I was... A, no, you give them money, they're just going to squander it on drugs and, and outrageous things and then nothing. And I think it was in Stockton. We were talking about in Stockton, they gave everybody a minimum income. And it worked. In Finland, they did the same thing. And what these people did is they used the money to better their situation, to get some, some uh, education, and to make their lives better lives. Why don't we have that faith that the majority of human beings want to better themselves instead of saying, yeah, if you give them money, they're never going to want to earn anything? I don't know the answer. Well, and they just, uh, Trump just cut welfare benefits the people and he's just increased food stamps them. and stuff so it's uh you just have to be rich and, why and you have to live in a gated community and that's fuck right. everybody else that's right and why the republicans people... care about families but only specifically their, their families, families. <laughs> that's right but aren't there enough of us aren't there enough of us that object not little... enough that vote that's the problem that's the it? problem young people don't vote millennials don't vote and uh minorities don't vote why? So minorities um, don't vote. And it was um, the majority of college-educated white women that elected Trump. So it is. You're uh, kidding. This country is the way it is because of college-educated college women. White women. I cannot believe. Yeah. I'm so a college-educated white woman. When you see woman. a woman driving a minivan to soccer practice, spit at her. She's the way things are. She's the way things the are. The, the the women you see on these videos calling the cops. On black people for having a picnic in a park. That's horrible. They are the ones who have made this country the way it is. So they got theirs. Fuck everybody else. So what's what would make the millennials vote? The millennials have given up. The millennials say, listen, we don't have a future. We've been robbed. But it isn't true. They do have a future. They just have to... You have to... You know, life, I say this all the time, and I probably said it the last time we, we, we talked. Life is like a card game. You take the hand you've got, and you got to play it. You, you get the hand. You can't help that. It's, it's random. Then you've got to play it. And I don't understand why the millennials don't fight back. I don't get it. Why, don't they, why are they just sitting there knitting and staying at home and complaining? That's, well, if we threatened to take away their Instagram. Yeah, if we did, then they would do something. <laughs> if we took away their iPhones, that would do it. So you told me... A long time ago, you did a show. I don't know if it was a radio show, but it was about books. And the, the it was name called of the What's show, Hot. What's Hot Between, between the covers. covers. 
And somebody said to me, what's hot between the covers? Menopausal women. I thought, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, what's hot between the what covers? What a brilliant name for a, a book show review. that talks about books. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was that show like and oh, what are God, your favorite books? Oh, God, it was books? so exciting. It was, I have many, many favorite books. I have one favorite book after another. I have new ones now. I love uh, David Nichols, Us, and what was, I think it was Sweet Sixteen. Uh, I love... Um, are these fiction books? Yeah, they're fiction. I like nonfiction, too. I never can remember the authors. This Dutch book was absolutely wonderful. This, I want to talk about that. Andrew Yang is trying to do this minimum income thing. Nobody wants him, and it's such a good idea. It would solve some of this homeless problem. It would solve it. But I believe, we come right back to my optimism, I believe we're on our way. I believe you you read about, if, if the news keeps on the way it's going, our, the, the newspapers used to be middle of the road, but now I think they're much more left. Don't you think? The newspapers? Yes. Why well, some, I think that... Um... Of course, Fox News is a problem. Yeah, but there's that one uh, company that owns all of these local television stations, and they showed like two years ago where they were, basically they had all of these news presenters read this exact same news piece ah. that was just complete Republican propaganda. And somebody took this video of all these different uh, newscasters, and it was supposed to be, I forget what it was about, but um, I, 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 so what I, is it I like think everything's uh, either hard left or hard right. There's no middle. There's there. no middle. There's and we no need middle. objective journalism anymore. I'm getting that sense, too, because I read the New York Times, and the, and, and, and the New York Times is left. It's left. Um, the Guardian, I read in, in, in Britain, it's left. And if I do the Daily Mail, it's right. Yeah. So I don't. And, but we have, we have the Internet. We are getting our news sources from everywhere. It can be a problem. Used to be that you only got news sources from people that had to verify what they said. Now you get it from everyone. But you can choose. You can listen to all sides of everything. You couldn't before. I really believe that, that the world is opening up. You think we're going to a better place? I do. We're going to a place where everybody can be who they want to be. We can find a way. There is a way because you one can of be the, whoever you want to be in your gated community. In your gated community, <laughs> with your your four wheel drive and your child in a private school, you can be whatever you want to be. I think we know options now. One of my favorite jokes is Andre the Wonder Woman, who says, "I didn't." Children, she says, "Young people are killing their parents." I didn't know it was an option. And what I'm trying to say is that because of television and because of the internet, everybody knows options. They don't always know how to get them, but they know. But they can do research. They can do it online. But then we were talking to somebody last night who was talking about how frightening artificial intelligence is because we're very, human beings are very prone to suggestion. And artificial intelligence is that stuff that when, you know how you buy one thing from Amazon and then for the next 20 years you get things saying Amazon recommends and it's all related to what you bought? Yeah. It's that that we have a tendency to be, we're very influenced by suggestion. And so we often are, we're often, we often change our minds because of what big corporations and what moneyed people want us uh, to think. And I think we were talking uh, last night and we were saying that when it stops being profitable for people to be homeless, it's profitable for the rich to have people like that. They make money off of that. Off of homeless people. Off the of homeless How people. So? Because they're they're not having to support them. They're not having to they're able to use their money for whatever they want. They can they don't have to they they escape taxes, they escape everything, and what that they escape they escape spending their money on the things that would help these people. And these people so it's to their advantage that they've got these smart accountants and they don't have to pay taxes. They can they can they can indulge themselves at the expense of the people who are the ones that are pouring their coffee and delivering their groceries. And they, what is it? I think it's, it's Adrian, Adrian Rich, who is, uh, she's a couple years older than I am, and she's a, um, a militant lesbian, but she writes beautiful essays. And she says, yeah, who was it that said that we all have to work for a guy that's sitting at home uh, 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 doing nothing and sailing around on his yacht 
and drinking champagne and uh, eating strawberries. Who said that the common man has to work eight to ten hours a day for hardly enough to buy a loaf of bread or rent an apartment so that he can live that way? I haven't thought about that. That's what's happening. And it's to their advantage to have, to have these people that are taking nothing from the system. They're just sitting and shitting on the street, and, and they're getting everything. So that's and and it's true as long as it, it as long as they can because I'm sure you know that all countries are really run by people that we don't even know that are immensely wealthy because money is power. If we could change it, I don't know, Tom. Let's go out and try and change it, not make money power. Let's make let's make love power. I love that. I love love. A good cuddle. Yeah. You don't need a bank account. You get a good cuddle if he smells good. But that's the way. That's I'd the like way this I car. I have yeah. no money, but <laughs> but I love this I'll car. I'll hold you real tight. <laughs> I'll hold you real tight. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. So back to books and the what's hot between the covers. So what <laughs> is your favorite book of all time? You know, my favorite book of all time is God of Small Things. Okay, what do you know what that's about? What, it's about uh, the knowledge nugget did you gain from that book? It's about how evil, how evil and pernicious prejudice is. It's about the Pakistani Indian War, and this woman that has an affair with a well, Indian woman that has an affair with a Pakistani, and how it's it. You know what it reminds me? Of? It's how ignorant people who don't try to enlarge their scope and their vision cast a judgment that can destroy. God of Small Things, Arundhati Roy, absolutely wonderful. Another one, How Green Was My Valley. Oh, my God. I can't believe you just said that. I, well, I just did, How Green Was My Valley. My uh, now deceased Uncle John Miller. Oh, my relative. Not yeah. Really. Um, that was his favorite book of all time. <clears throat> and um, Do you remember the if line he, in if, it? If it came up in conversation, he would start crying. It's the most gorgeous book. He loved that book so much. I love that and book. And I read that book, and it's one of the saddest books I ever read in my life. These mining people, I think they're in Wales, and then there's this guy in the story where this big vat of... Um, oh, he falls in it. He, like, it falls on top of his head. He's basically just... He's skeletal. His his face has been burned away. The uh, he, you... He's absolutely hideous. And then the, the story with the girl and the boy, <clears throat> they're going to get together... You think they're going to get together, and uh, they never get together. The book ends, and they... The... Because that's what Wales was like then. But my favorite line in it, that's what Wales was like. That My favorite line in it is when the, the guy takes his kid, and they're looking in the barn when this the dummy, the, state, the, the town dummy, is giving birth. And this kid is seeing this woman giving birth alone, just giving birth. And he says to this kid... It makes me cry every time. I'm like your, I'm like your friend that cries. Uncle. That your uncle. He says, look at that. He said, we all began that way. In other words, nobody's big and nobody's little. We all began that way. The other one I love is um, To Kill a Mockingbird, the book, To Kill a Mockingbird. Because what was the guy's name, the, the guy that, uh, oh, I can't remember their names and it's falling around in my head. Okay. But, Hmm? Which guy? The guy that's the dummy. The guy that that, that actually. Boo Radley. He, yeah, and he saves what's her name? Skip. Sc- Scout. Scout. He saves her. I start crying at that too. He's the one that saves her. Yeah. And another one is um, John Steinbeck of Mice and Men, when Lenny squeezes the little mouse and kills it, and then of course he squeezes the lady and kills her too. Yeah. He said, "I love I was soft just at things." The Steinbeck Museum. Um, oh. There's the John Steinbeck uh, glass. I see it. I see it. I didn't get one of those. You just gave one to yourself. You self. I gave you the nicer no, glass. I, I gave I, you my favorite glass yeah. to drink out of. It was just plain. I would like this John, John Steinbeck we can glass, trade. you selfish bastard. <laughs> man. Uh, man. You mean yeah. selfish? I highlight you and praise <laughs> you. No, you're, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. And you see things that people don't see. They just see a doddering old lady. And, you know, I was, uh, Ross Turner came to my show last night. And he said, yeah, I remember he was being really aggressive and really pushy. And I wasn't at all. I was just trying to get gigs when I was 70 and nobody wanted me. It's a funny thing when no one wants you. It's a funny thing. You can go two ways. You can say, well, they're probably right. <laughs> 
No one wants me because I'm no good, or you can think. And this was me ever since I was a little girl. No, no, there's, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. That was always inside me because I was very much uh, uh, um, diminished and abused as a child, verbally, never physically, as a child. I was the, I was the odd man out. And I think it's because I was odd. I think it's because I was probably an odd, crazy little kid. But I was always uh, diminished and, 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 and abused verbally by my family. And I kept thinking, no, no, they're wrong. <laughs> no, no, they're wrong. And it took me until I was 86 to finally say that somebody say, yeah, maybe they were wrong. It's not they were wrong, but maybe they were wrong. So by the time I'm 100, who knows? I might make it big. I might get to the O2. Yeah, yeah, right. By the time I'm well, what can you teach us about rejection? Because this business is full of rejection, and yeah, I mean, you've dealt with a lot of uh, bullshit. A tremendous amount. I think that what I can teach you about rejection is you have to think it's always subjective. It's always subjective. And the other thing you have to think is everybody is trying to protect themselves. Everybody is trying to protect themselves in this business. This is a business. And we think, oh, my God, I'm talented. Why am I not discovered? It's a business. They don't look at you and say, ooh, that's, you're talented. They think, how many tickets can you sell? How much money can I make off of you? That's how you make it big. That's Selling how you tickets. Make- if, that's you can, how you make it if you can sell tickets, that's what you were talking about with Carol Beer. That's your, if you can sell tickets... But that has nothing to do with the quality of what you do. I've been in Edinburgh and I've gone to shows where there are like two of us there. And it's the best, most sensitive, wonderful show. And then I go to shows that are completely sold out and everybody's standing at the back and it's a piece of shit. Yeah. But they, they had a great name. or they had, there, was, there was a show called um, Beyonce. Or I think it was Beyonce. Is, or somebody, no, Adele. Adele is older than I meaning that they haven't made it and Adele did. Adele is wonderful, by the way. I really like yeah. her. Um, and that show sold out because of the name Adele. Mm. The show was terrible. Well, I always say you can't let other people decide how you feel about yourself. Yeah, you mustn't. You can get rejected by clubs, TV networks. By people. Relationships, people. You can't you do can't that. You can't let other people decide you, your own value. You have to believe in yourself. And I think, I've told you this and I tell you this every time and I will tell it again and again. When I taught school, children like to cheat. So I would give a test and they would be looking and I would say to the kid, I don't want you to be like the one on the left. I don't want you to be like the one on the right. We have one of those. Be like you. That's what we need in this world. And if people can understand that the very thing that we all fight in this civilization, being different, is the one thing the world needs. We need it. We don't need a bunch of sheep. Well, we do, but they're sheep. We, we don't need a bunch of sheep. We need individuals. We need people like Greta Thornburg, whose last name I'm mispronouncing again uh, because I can't remember because I'm old. We need little girls like that that aren't afraid. I remember when I was in Pacifica, this little girl, she was just a little, she was about 10 or 11, and she heard about the, the, the fact that, that the trees, the forests were being destroyed. And she said to her father, I'm going to plant a thousand trees. And he looked at her, he said, sure you are. And she said, yes, I am. And she was in a 4-H club, little children, little kids club. And she contacted the 4-H clubs all over the country. And she got pretty close to a thousand trees she planted. They all planted trees. She said, I'm going to do it. We have people like that. That's great. We have people that think outside the box. If we stay in the box, we're going to end up with Donald Trump. And I don't want to be in a box with Donald Trump. He'll grab my pussy and I won't like it. When was the last time? I'm kidding. No, I, uh... <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. If you think I'm going to tell you that, you're out of your mind. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> what was the last? What time? insights from teaching did have you used in stand-up comedy? The insights that I from teaching, what I learned is that nobody wants to hate you. No, but they don't want to be shoved into a situation where they're forced to do something that makes them uncomfortable. And that's really big. That makes them uncomfortable. You do this, and I do it now when I get on stage. The first thing you do is you make people feel very comfortable I'm, and you that, that you're their equal. You're not better than they are. You do it. So you talk about being a Florida cracker. You talk about you don't make them feel you're superior. I... I Obviously, when I get up there, they know they're not superior. They say, oh, God, look at that. You, 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 you don't threaten them. 
That's the first thing I learned. Because when I taught, I used to lecture, and I used to think, no, I don't want these children to feel threatened by me, because if I do, they're not going to learn what I want to teach them. It was, I taught the humanities. I taught to appreciate books and well, music and literature. And that's the, what, the best thing that you taught people in humanities? That's what I taught. Yeah, I taught them, taught them to love the arts, and I taught them to find their creativity within them. That's what I'm trying to do on this podcast. Well, that's what we're doing, aren't we? <laughs> we are creative. We are. What's different. the best thing about being in your 80s? Uh, that you're not dead. Pretty much. Yeah. I'm, I'm I find that, that uh, happiness is not being dead. No. Happiness is being where you want to be. Happiness is having something to look forward to. I have something to look forward to. I have the best life. I have the best life. I have something to look forward to every morning uh, when I do get up, which is always a risk. But once I, if I can just get out of bed, I've got a lot to do. I have a lot to look forward to. And it's all possible that's the thing that's bothering millennials. They they think, no, it's not possible. They're defeated before they begin. So millennials, if you're listening, get up there and try. You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. We're going to save the environment. Donald Trump might be reelected, but we just have four more years. If we can just live through that, we're all set. <laughs> we can do it. We can <clears throat> plant a tree. Plant a tree. Give someone a cuddle. That'll change. <laughs> what is the best joke you've written lately? Oh, lately, that's one when I get up and I say, I'm the bitch that takes your seat on the bus. I'm like, that's a good one. Nice. Yeah. Uh, that I've written lately. I don't know. I just heard a new one. I just heard a new one. Uh, at my age, my best break is going to be a hip fracture. That's Pippi Lovestock and gave that one to me. I worked with John Cooper Clark and he said, I'm so old, I don't even buy green bananas. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. <laughs> and I say, I'm so wrinkled, I took my bulldog to the vet and he gave me the shot. I tried to say Sharpay, but nobody knew what a Sharpay was. That's a better joke, but they don't know what a Sharpay is. Yeah. I don't know. You make fun of the things that you're angry about. Do you do that too? I do. I'm sure I do that. I'm angry. I'm angry about ageism. I'm angry that people limit me when they don't know what I can do. I'm angry that people judge me because of my age. If I hear one more at your age, Judy Dench talks about that. She says... Yeah, there are things we can do and there are things we can't do, but you need to let us decide what we can do. And one of the things, one of my other jokes is everybody always wants to take my elbow and help me across the street, even when I don't want to go across the street. Now, don't do that to me. Don't do that. Give me a chance to be me. Give me a chance to be the best I can be wherever I am in life. And I won't take that away from you. That's important too. I don't want to demean anyone else. So I learned from teaching that, that we're all, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. We're all equal. I don't like the British class system. I don't like people to think that intrinsically they're better. There's nobody. We're all, I mean, being human is a great thing, I think. I don't know whether, I don't know whether. What's your favorite thing about being back in California? Seeing the people that I love. Seeing the people I love. I don't feel at home here. No, not anymore? No, no. It feels... How many years did you live here? 80. Oh, California, 30. Yeah. Ohio. God, I would go back to Ohio. I think I would probably throw up. I mean, what's happening in Ohio? <laughs> Jesus. It's a Toledo, swing state Ohio. that never swings the other way. It never swings the other Why way. Why do they call it a swing state? <laughs> I don't know. Do they call it a swing state? It's they been do. Republican <clears throat> for years. What is the best joke you have for children? You got any good kids jokes? Oh, I'm, no, I'm filthy. Children's? Children? I don't have a joke for children. It's not a joke to be a child. It's tough. Everyone else is in charge. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a child. What either. is 10,000 feet tall made of pepperoni? The Leaning Tower of Pizza. The Screaming Tower of Pizza. The Screaming Tower. Okay, all right. <laughs> what is uh, black and white and red all over? That's a newspaper. That's children. Okay. What is? I don't know. I would never want to be a child. Would you want to be a child again? I'm still a child. I'm still holding on. We, we say that, but I mean really a child. I wouldn't want to be formed. No, I'm in my 50s. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I like the 50s. I love the 50s. Each year gets better. Each year gets better, and starting in 50, it really gets really better. Because up until 50, you're still fighting to establish who you are. 
Well, I think it's interesting that once um, you get old enough to see the world properly, your eyesight you starts see- to go. <laughs> You're right. You're right. But do you see the world properly? <clears throat> I don't. I still see the world through my rose-colored glasses. Yeah. I'm, it's called I'm selective saying. perception. I see what I want to see. One of my favorite stories is that I remember very distinctly graduating from Stanford with all A's. And because I'm going to get a PhD, I want to get a PhD, I sent for my transcript. I did not graduate from Stanford with all A's. I had a lot of B's and a lot of A's. But I, but I, I remember distinctly that I graduated with all A's. And I'm looking at the transcript. I did not. It's called Selective Perception. You remember what you want to remember. I've just written a memoir uh, that was supposed to be published, and then the publisher... I have two of your books on these shelves here. Thoughts While Walking the Dog. Yeah, I have that. And more Thoughts While Walking the Dog. I have both of them. Yes. You don't have the Starving Hearts and the Late Bloomer. They're fun. I should bring you one the next time. Come to London. I'll give you more books. I will come back to London. And now we have a place for you to stay. Just you have to grow long curls and put on a hat. And I have to be Jewish yeah, and you'll... elderly to stay in, in your building. You have to wear a little white scarf. Yeah. That's and cool. you have to. You know, I'll, you I'll break out the yarmulke. I yeah, and, from yeah, but Jerusalem. you can't do a single. Th- on Friday, you can't do a thing. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't do a thing. All you can do is eat. Jews eat. For some reason, we don't believe that eating is working. Everything else. My is mother working. and I were in Jerusalem like two oh, Saturdays yeah. in a row. There was nothing to eat. We were starving, and there was a really. There, because there was a, I didn't know Jerusalem was that Jewish. I thought it was everybody. Oh my God, Jerusalem uh, is very religious. Religious, but not Jewish. <clears throat> You've got all the other... Jerusalem no, is gold. Didn't you love that it's gold? It's golden. It's beautiful. But it's so we're, we're, we're uh, two Saturdays in a row. We had to wait. There was like a Palestinian um, shawarma shop that opened like at six. And we were oh, there. They don't do anything <clears throat> on Saturday either? The Muslims? They do. And that's why they were open. <laughs> and we were starving, waiting for this place to open. And uh, I'm sitting there putting pictures on my Instagram and we hear all these gunshots and my mom oh my is flipping God. out and she's like, honey. Oh my God. And um, I'm Ooh. like, mom, my Instagram is more important than my life. <laughs> yeah, I've got it. I'm yeah. kidding. But uh, <laughs> no, it turned out it was, a he's pal- not kidding. it was a Palestinian wedding that was celebrating with fireworks. Why would you celebrate anything uh, in with fire fireworks? You're just going to cause Jer- trouble. Jerusalem. You're right. I can't imagine. <clears throat> yeah, we were shitting in our pants. Oh my God, I would have too. You hear that? I'm, have you been? Have you been to Tel Aviv? Have, did you go? I to stayed Tel- in Tel Aviv. It's like Miami with machine guns. Yeah, they have machine guns there. They in Tel Aviv? Uh-huh. <clears throat> yeah, there's a few machine guns there. That's terrible. Have you been to Israel? No, no it's too expensive. I can't afford it. I went to Israel after the Six-Day War. They had the big Six-Day War. And I felt sorry for the Arabs. They had gotten, because they displaced everybody. Because what is it they say, what the problem with the Jews is they don't realize you can't, you can't move into property that belongs to someone else. But that's all iffy, iffy, iffy. I remember Exodus. I remember when the Jews were wandering around in a, in a ship because nobody would take them. I, it's, it's so problematical. You can make, you can make, judgments about any race and every race has they've they've had to fight to be who they are and i mean i think we're getting to the point that's what i'm talking about where everybody can be who they are i think that i think that prejudice is more with maybe the upper classes and more what we read about than what we feel i really don't believe people feel i mean when i went to kuala lumpur i just couldn't believe it you know nobody from israel is allowed in there i don't i'm they don't allow Israel passports, you can't get No in. kidding. Yeah. But I, of course, I don't have an Israel passport, but they don't hate Jews. Somebody said to me, don't do your Jewish jokes. And I said, listen, honey, all my jokes are Jewish. They come from a Jewish lady. And they were fine. They were fine. The audiences were sophisticated. They loved They, they loved to laugh. That was the thing you so have. What have I learned? I learned that people love to laugh. People love to laugh. And people don't come to these comedy shows they don't come to these comedy shows to criticize you or to say, make me laugh. They don't do that. They say, I paid money or I paid time. I want you to, I want you to make me laugh. So they're on your side. I think the world is on your side. I don't believe it's an enemy. I don't believe it's an, uh, 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 an angry world. It's, it's, I think it's a, a frustrated world. Okay, I'm going to start looking at things differently now. I, oh, I should certainly hope so, Tom. Lynn Ruth, I love you with all my heart. It's, I love you, too. It's great to have you here at the Rhodes Library. 
<laughs> the Rhodes Library, you should see it. In closing, is there any words of wisdom or advice that you have for the people of the earth? Yeah, I say don't be afraid to try. Get up there and do what you want to do. What is, I'll give you my favorite quote. Do what you love best. The word woods, the woods would be very silent if the only birds who sang were those who sang best. Do what you love. Amen. Amen. And I don't even believe in God. <laughs> okay, Lynn Ruth, long may you run, my friend. It won't be that long. <laughs> Shalom, amigos. Yeah, thank e you very much. amigas. <laughs> buenos, right. buenos dias and all that shit. And all that shit. <laughs> yeah. All right, Lynn Ruth, I hope to thank see you, you in London very soon. I God, I hope so. Have a cheap place. I'll grow out the little sideburns and, and bring, bring get your, a curling iron. And, and wear your white. Yeah, curling iron. <laughs> I thought that was something else. I wonder how do they make them How curl? do the Jewish people make the sideburns curl? No, because like I don't that. know whether you saw that little clip I gave you. I had these long things hanging. Mm -hmm. Couldn't make them curl. Could be they didn't want to. They might, they, they, my little Is there a little curling iron for that? No, I don't, I don't have a curling iron. No. I don't have a curling iron. I have a bagel. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the you best put a bagel, bagel shop in LA yeah, is right yeah, here. Yeah, a bagel. Mm. Maybe we we'll do a bagel. It's been fun. Okay, my darling. I love you very much. You too. I love you too. Thanks, Lynn Ruth. Tom Rhodes, you're a funny man. Tom Rhodes, you're an international comedian. Tom Rhodes, karate kick, baby. Oh, yeah. You're a groovy dude You go all around the world Telling jokes to all of the people You are an international comedian You're funny to everybody in every single country in the world Tom Rhodes, I like you very much I think you're talented and very wonderful Best guy in the world. I wanna be your friend. You should call me sometime. Here is my phone number 603-644-0048. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom Rhodes. You're an international comedic sensation. Tom Rhodes, I like to listen to your podcast. Tom Rhodes. You're the best man to ever walk on the earth. <laughs>